Frank Sinatra wrote a book on vocal technique? No. You can pick yours up on the way out. <laughs> <laughs>
Good morning. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter. Welcome to St. Giles. My name's Josh. This is Rebecca. We're going to be taking you through the... Hey, we arrived. We made it all through Lent. We've been journeying, 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 and here we are at the, at the resurrection, renewing this deep hope we have within each one of us. The tomb was empty. He's not here. He's risen. He's risen! <laughs> Friends, are you ready to worship this morning? Let's bring glory and honor to his name. Would you stand? Let us sing. Let's pray. Jesus, our glorious King, we worship you this morning. We proclaim with a worldwide church that you are the resurrection and life eternal, and we say thank you. 
Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your life and abundance now in the days to come and eternity. We say thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you, Jesus. And help us this morning to gaze at you in wonder and worship you in joy, our King and risen Savior. Amen. Let's continue in worship.
In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when My all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Ooh, here in the love of Christ I'll stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was lame Here in the death of Christ I live Oh, we live There in the ground His body lay Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since first and the last of his grip on me.
Here in Christ we stand, here we stand. Friends, let's continue standing and this Easter morning, let's declare what we believe, saying the Apostles' Creed. You're welcome to look in your hymnal, it's in the very back, or join in on the screen. Let's say this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, descended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, but all of our kids come on up for a time of children's blessing. All right, come on down, kids. Come on in, come on in. All right, I I brought what is often, you know, kind of the star of the show around Easter, it would seem, and that is the bunny. The bunny. Yeah, well, actually, you can. I'm going to ask you to pass this around. Now, there's a reason. This is actually my daughter's bunny, and you guys can pass it around and just feel her. Does, does anybody know what kind of bunny that's supposed to be? I know you know. <laughs> Say it again. Kind of an Easter bunny. This is, uh, but this long-haired bunny is a very special type of bunny. Does anybody ever know what, know what it's called? Go ahead, guys. Angora bunny. Now, Patrick knows this because we used to have Angora bunnies. When Addie was your age, she raised Angora bunnies. And they had this really long hair and they were really soft. They actually brought something else. We'd give them haircuts and make fun little things out of their hair. You can pass this around. Feel how soft that is. Now, you got to pass it around kind of fast so everybody gets a chance to feel it. Isn't it wild? That's from a bunny. Now, I know, right? And so every Easter, where do you think our kids found their Easter baskets? By the Easter bunnies. By the Easter bunnies, right. They'd always be by our bunnies somewhere. We, we, would, we would joke and say that, that our bunnies knew the Easter bunny. <laughs> but you want to know something? We felt like we had the best bunnies ever. And so let me, I have a picture for you. These are some of Addie's bunnies. So... <laughs> So these are little Angora bunnies. And they were, yeah. And they were just these little balls of fluff. They looked like they were big. And they were like this big, except really they were like this big with all this fluff. And we felt like we had the most wonderful bunnies in the world. We loved, they, they were nice and soft. You could snuggle with them. And every Easter, we'd go spend time, a little extra time with our bunnies. But do you want to know something? As wonderful as our bunnies were, and we thought they were the best, we would remind ourselves that they point to something that is so much more wonderful, don't they? What do they really point to? Jesus. They point to Jesus. They point to the fact that he is risen, right? That every ounce of celebration that we have in Easter, whether it's the bunnies or the eggs or getting to dress up or put flowers on the cross, all of it points to something so much bigger and much more wonderful, and that's Christ is risen, that we are loved, loved, loved by God who would go to death and back for you, for you. So I want to encourage you, as you wear your Easter bunny ears, as we have the big Easter egg hunt right after church, and every time you see a bunny, I want it to be a little reminder to you that as wonderful as it is, it represents something even more wonderful, and that is what? Jesus. Jesus, that he's risen from the grave, that he's conquered death, 
But not only that, who did he do it for? He did it for us. Everybody put your finger on your head, adults included. He did it for you, right here, right now. So let me, let me give, give you an Easter blessing. Lord, I, I bless these kids in your name. May they know the joy, the amazement. May they know how wonderful it is that you love them. And may everything about this day point their hearts and their minds towards you. In your wonderful name, we pray this, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. You may return to your seats with your families.
Yes. That was the right response. Thank you, community choir. Now, I know what you're thinking. Where did we go hire all these professionals? This is the community choir. People just jump in and volunteer. You too could sound like this by joining the community choir. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna lie. We dodged a bullet. Anybody know the date today? March 31st. We were this close to having an April Fool's Easter. <laughs> I mean, as a guy who loves a good dad joke, we're probably all better for it. Um, this morning, we're going to look at Mark's resurrection account. And of all the accounts, it is the least of the April. It, maybe it is the most April Fool's because it ends at, in the most odd fashion. Really, that's it? That's, that's, that's how you're going to stop it right there, Mark? It's just eight verses. And yet, as we look at it this morning, I think we're going to see that each one of us is being invited into something rich, something beautiful, something wonderful, if we'll hear it. If we'll hear it. Let's open to Mark 16. You're, feel free to grab a pew Bible. We'll also put it up on the screen for you. Mark 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. And they entered the tomb. They saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's been raised. He's not here. Look, there's the place they laid him. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for us. Jesus, as we step into this wild moment, just a wild moment, earth-changing, revelational, wild moment, would you speak to us right now through the power of your spirit, use your word to guide us and meet us this Easter Sunday. We pray it in your name, Christ. Amen. He is risen. risen now, there's a little part in the Bible that says, essentially, based on whichever version you're reading, that some Bibles don't even have anything after verse eight, and then some have an extra piece, but most scholars think that probably got added later, later in, in, in the development of scripture. And, uh, and so there it ends, right there, Mark eight, right? And they lived happily ever after, right? That's how it ends, right? <laughs> No, as a matter of fact, of all the Gospels, Mark's conclusion is probably the furthest from happily ever after. It's actually a bit awkward. And uh, we, we might actually appreciate a little more happily ever after from Mark. Um, now, I can see we have some experts in the room this morning. I'm kind of curious. Kids, kids, where are you? Kids, if you're a kid, raise your hand. I need your help on this. What, what kind of literature or movie are we most likely to hear the phrase happily ever after? Princesses, fairy tale. Yeah, we're hitting it. You're nailing it. You're nailing it. All right, here's a harder question. Adults, you can help if you want. What was the first Disney movie ever to really present the concept of happily ever after? I'll give you a clue. It was their first ever full featured film from 1937. Snow White, that's right. 
There it is in all its glory, snow white and the seven dwarves. Now, one day she will find her prince who will carry her away to his castle and they will live happily ever after. She was close, but it wasn't quite the same prince that she was thinking of. This would be a prince of peace. And happily ever after is not the phrase. And Mark certainly doesn't give us a happily ever after ending, does he? Um, I don't think he intended to, to be honest. As a matter of fact, I think we, uh, we want to call Mark's ending anything but happily ever after. Let's, let's call it something else. Let's call it this. Let's call it hopefully ever after. Mark gives us a hopefully ever after ending because the power and truth of the resurrection invites us to experience the deep and rich hope of Christ. Not in our happily ever afters, right? But right in the middle of real life, right in the middle of real life where everything isn't always easy and doesn't necessarily go the way we had planned. All right, I'm gonna give another opportunity of raised hands. Who's been paying attention to March Madness? This is the confession of the morning, okay? Um, I recently listened to a short speech that it's become quite popular. It's from the head coach of the Duke women's program, Kara Lawson, also a believer. And uh, the talk that she gave has nothing to do with faith per se, but you can hear the resonance of it in what she says. Um, in talking to her team, she makes this observation. She says, everyone waits in life for things to get easier. Everybody's waiting for something to get easier. Uh, think about it. We do kind of do that, don't we? We wait for things to get easier. What do you wait for? What do you wait to get easier? What do you tell yourself? You know, as soon as I get through this season of work, things will get easier, right? No? As soon as I get through whatever season of life, this will get easier. As soon as my kids get older, it'll get easier. As soon as I retire, things will get easier. As soon as I get to 12th grade, things will get easier. I'll finally be a senior. They'll respect me right? Let's name your scenario. It's so tempting to live life waiting for things to get easier. Coach Lawson's brilliant reply to this was that she looks her team sternly in the eye and says, it will never get easier. What happens is that you become someone who handles hard better. What happens is that you become someone who handles hard better. Sage life advice, but when you take it into the power and the truth of the resurrection, you become someone who is filled immensely with hope. Immensely with hope, right? That I'm not the one that handles hard better, that through Christ I can handle anything better, right? You know, I say this every once in a while, Christianity doesn't come with an easy button. I never promised it. Uh, But instead, what the power of the resurrection does is it reaches right into the very lives we're living, right here, right now, March 31st, 2024, and promises eternal hope that empowers us to live this life, not the fairy tale one, not the one we've made up that, you know, once I get through this and get through this, finally have that life I'm looking for. But this life, the one you woke up in this morning, It's a powerful statement St. Paul makes in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, through Christ who gives me strength. We say it really easily, but the power of that statement is enormous. It's about as resurrection talk as it gets. I can do hard better through Christ who gives me strength. Jesus meets me with hope eternal, even in my most challenging places, even in my own sin, my own shame, my own inadequacies. The power of the resurrection is bigger than even that. Our scripture this morning 
takes us right to the face of hopelessness, right? That what is more hopeless than death itself? Um, if you've got the chance to travel through Holy Week this week, maybe you got to go to a Good Friday service um, where we really focused in on the crucifixion of Christ. And our text picks up right after he's been crucified and buried. And the women who have stood beside him to the end, they wake up early the next morning to finish the burial process by anointing him and they arrive at the tomb and what do they see? What do they see? It's empty, it's wide open, the door, the the door, the stone, (laughs) if it were only a door, the stone, the big enormous stone that would have covered a tomb has been rolled away. And instead of the body of of Jesus, who's there? An angel, an angel. Now I know it says a young man dressed in a white robe, but let's be honest, who's raised boys? The second a boy looks at a white robe, it's dirty. He doesn't even have to wear it. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a boy, it's, a, it's an angel. We have the other gospels to affirm that for us, but an angel is there. And what does he say? Oh, the same thing they always say, do not be alarmed, do not be afraid. Have you ever noticed, no matter how many times they say it, it never works? But he gives it a shot. And the next thing he says is so important. As a matter of fact, you know, we, for those of you who are visiting today, at St. Giles, we spent the whole year going through Mark. And you can, you can go online and catch up. It's like 30-something sermons. I promise you, you'll know the context and you'll, and you'll sleep like a baby. But <laughs> we've been traveling all through Mark and we've arrived at this moment. And everything that has happened in Mark comes to the grand conclusion chapter 16, verse six. All of it, all of it is building up to this one moment right here. If you've been reading it straight through, which it marks the the shortest gospel. If you ever wanna just read one straight through, give it a shot, go with Mark. And it arrives at this. If you've been reading it straight through, this is the line you've been waiting to arrive at. Is Jesus really the person he says he is, right? Is he really, as Mark states in the first verse of the whole thing, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Could all of this really be true? Because if it is, this story doesn't just become an incredible story. My story becomes an incredible story, right? And the angel says, do not be alarmed. Hmm. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's been raised. He's not here. Look, that's the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. I know why you came, but everything's changed. Nothing will ever be the same because he's been raised. He's not here. He's not here. And then there's this strange conclusion to the whole thing, right? Right? Now I want you to picture this with me. It's like Mark's written this beautiful play and we're in the most crucial scene. We've, we've stuck with it all the way. There's been highs, there's been lows, there's been some serious lows, but then there's this moment, this grand moment, and this angel makes this incredible declaration, and then the women, in fear and amazement, they run off the stage, the curtain closes, and you and I were watching this, and we lean in, and everything gets really quiet, and we're like, what's going to happen next? And we wait. Wait. And then the fluorescent lights come on. (laughs) And we look and the orchestra's packing up its instruments. And the stage lights turn off and a guy with a broom comes out. And you and I are looking at each other like, that's it? that's it, they run off, 
And that's how we're gonna conclude the story. Now we know there's more to the story, don't we? You've got four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the other three do a really great job of telling us what comes next. You know, you can get better conclusions if you would like, right? You can go read Matthew's gospel, the women run away, they encounter Jesus, and it concludes with this beautiful scene right before Jesus ascends into heaven, he gives them the great commission. One of the most powerful scenes in all of scripture, right? You can go read Luke. The women go back, they tell the disciples and all the disciples are like, whatever, we don't believe you. Except for one guy, Peter, who takes off running. And actually in John's account, it's Peter and John. I love, Peter and John's one of my favorites because it's written by John. And when they arrive, it says, and and the beloved disciple, John, arrived first as if to say, (laughs) I won, right? Let it be be ordained for all of time. John won the race. He beat Peter to the... And then, and then there's the beautiful moment in John where, where Mary is, you know, everybody leaves, but there's Mary by herself in the garden, weeping, weeping. Surely to goodness they've stolen the body of my Lord. But then what does she hear? Mary. Mary. Oh, and it makes the resurrection not just this big, beautiful truth, but this big, beautiful, personal truth. He calls you by name, Mary. Hmm. And then there's Mark. And then there's Mark, ever the one for brevity, concludes this entire gospel with this enormous pronouncement. He has been raised, he is not here. And then the women run away and we're left to ponder the deep, deep significance of that proclamation. He leaves us with a statement, doesn't he? Perhaps of all the gospel writers, Mark takes the biggest risk. He leaves his gospel open-ended with this enormous hanging question to his listeners, how will you respond to this good news? What will you do? You see, there's no final act to Mark's gospel because you are the final act. You are the final act. Because here's the thing, it could be so easy to just read this, especially on Easter Sunday, right? There's, There's a thousand eggs out there. There's, I promise you, there's a lot of really good food. When you walk out of here, there's going to be drinks, there's going to be food, kids are going to be running around. We got things to get to. Man, Tennessee's playing at 220 to go to the final four tonight. I got places to go. (laughs) Now we can walk right out that front door. Whoa, that was a good story. Love that story. And they all lived happily ever after. Mark's not going to let us do that this morning, is he? He's not gonna let us do that this morning. Instead, the gospel refuses to let us just walk away and act like it was a glancing story. That was nice. Instead, it declares hope by laying this incredible news right in our laps and asking, what will you do with it? What will you do with this incredible news? If it's true, it's not just an incredible story, it means that my story could be an incredible story. That this hope, it's not just a feel-good hope, it's a living hope that's been passed to me right now, right? That's what First Peter says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection doesn't insult our intelligence by trying to sell us on a happily ever after story. Praise be to God. Instead, it tells us a hopefully ever after story one where there is no situation in life or death that is not under the authority and hope of Jesus Christ. It's what the great Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper says. He says, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. It's all mine. I've paid for it. 
I've gone to death and back for it. I have loved it with every ounce of my existence. And this morning, right now, you know, as we declare the hope of the resurrection, you know, on one hand, it's, it's so big that it transcends time and space, and yet it's so personal, so born out of love that it speaks to the three square feet you're sitting in right now. He's been raised. He's not here. Everything's changed. Nothing will ever be the same. Friends, let me ask you, where is Jesus declaring hope, real hope, into your lives this Easter Sunday? Whether it's the first time ever, the first time in a long time, or maybe just a refreshing of this truth for this season of life where you've been tempted to say, as soon as I get through this, it'll get easier. And the Lord's saying, no, don't buy that lie. Invite me to be the Lord of your life and let's do harder, better together. Where is he casting off the chains of this world and declaring freedom in your life through hope? Or to put it another way, what are the shortcomings, regrets, or shame that are still defining you? What are you still striving for? No matter how long you do it, it just can't scratch that itch to really define who you want to be. I have good news for you this morning. As a matter of fact, it's so good, it's called The Good News. He's been raised. He's not here. Christ has conquered the power of sin and death once for all. Brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, you have hope, and it is a hope eternal and he has declared over you that you may live hopefully ever after. Let me pray for us. Jesus, that truth is so big and so enormous and it's been spoken for 2,000 years and yet it is so personal and so intimate and so real and it is the word we need to hear preached into the very fiber of ourselves over and over and over again. Lord, I pray for each one of us here today that it would get through the busyness of our lives, through the complications of what we're working through in this very moment, and that it would speak almost just like a fresh breeze blowing right into our lives. Hope, hope, hope. There is no power of hell, no scheme of man that can pluck us from your hand. We just sang it. But Lord, we ask that you would take that deep into our very being. Teach us to trust you. Lord, help us this very day to live in that living hope. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, let's say it one more time. He is risen. risen Let's sing to that. Let's sing.
Come now before our Father in prayer. We, what a privilege it is that we can go straight to him in prayer. It's such a privilege. Let's do that together. Oh Lord, your grace is so amazing. It is so immense. Thank you. We've been saying that all morning and we just can't say it enough. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for breaking the chains of sin, shame, and death. Thank you for your freedom. Thank you for your victory. Thank you for your resurrection hope. And Lord, now we, we, we just ask, Lord, would you enter now into all those places where we need your resurrection hope, where we need them as individuals, where we need them as families, where we need them as neighborhoods as a city where we need it, as a nation and as a world. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, where there is despair, bring your unshakable hope. Where there is darkness, shine the light of your glory. Where there is sickness, speak your wholeness and tender care. Where there is grief, speak your comfort and peace. Where there is loneliness, speak your presence. Where there is doubt, speak your truth and promise. Transform us with your living hope. Oh Lord, transform us. Help us to live hopefully, to stand on your promises, and help us to go out from here and declare you boldly your resurrection hope to help us to take it into the world. And we pray all of this the way you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, what we're gonna do now, I think it's why half the people are actually here. Um, we have a St. Giles tradition where we close Easter by inviting anybody that wants to to come up into the chancel and sing the Hallelujah Chorus. This is exciting. If you have never done this and you've always wondered, 
Maybe I'll do it. Today's the day. You should do it. It is so loud. You j just for that alone, it's wonderful. But this is actually one of the more beautiful things we do all year round. And so I am going to give you the invitation, come forward, and then I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful Ben Miller, and he's going to tell you how it works. So come on up. You don't have to be a pro. Just come up and sing your heart out.
Thank you all, and it's another Easter miracle. All the Sopranos are still standing. Well done. If you're new with us today, we have a bag with some information and a journal and a pen we'd love to give you just to say thank you for coming and spending time with us today. Kids, kids, there are rules, right, Miss Heather? There are rules. They're going to meet you in the courtyard. Right out here. Yep. Right out here. So you go through those doors all the way, like you're going back into the church, but go into the little courtyard, little garden, and there you will receive your marching orders. So kids, where are we going? To the courtyard. Excellent. Well done. All right. Ms. Heather will meet you there. Adults? There's going to be snacks and beverages out. I encourage you, stick around, enjoy one another. The game doesn't start till 2.20. <laughs> Would you receive the benediction? Go forth in the matchless name of Jesus. Go forth as one who has hope, and not just any kind of hope, hope eternal. Go and live, hopefully, ever after in the wonderful name of Christ. Amen. Walk, walk, walk. Let's walk to the courtyard.